Good morning, everybody. Welcome um, to this uh, briefing webcast all about the world of financial planning. Um, I am Richard Brent, uh, Head of Content and uh, Editor-in-Chief here at Briefing. Um, if you're not familiar with, with us, that's um, what we like to think of as the publication for the, um, the world and the work of um, legal business management decision makers of all types um, working at uh, the world, the, um, the UK's largest law firms. Um, briefing is now available um, as an app. Um, all of our content is available in that app, um, which is, of course, uh, available on both Apple and uh, Android devices. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, please do um, please do download it uh, at some point soon. Um, briefing regularly features interviews with strategic and operational business leaders. Um, it carries case studies on specific change projects. It has an um, opinion and market analysis and, um, and our own um, research into the market, such as uh, our Briefing Frontiers series, which we publish every year, which polls um, strategic leaders like yourselves about the intersection of um, technology choices and uh, overall uh, business and growth strategy. We probably cover every aspect um, of legal business management you could, you could think of over the course of the year, uh, from uh, risk profiling, mitigation, to business development, activity and priorities, um, people management and engagement, and of course, and the, all the energies that feed into and the, um, the outputs that flow out of firms' efforts to innovate both internally and externally. Now, today's um, webcast is called A Smarter Future for Financial Planning. And we have case studies and a conversation with key people at two firms that have um, invested uh, significantly recently to change how business ties financial management today to longer term strategic planning and thinking. Um, understanding and communicating the, um, the, the impact of decisions about where and how work is resourced, for example, and staying agile enough to be able to respond to changing market conditions and demands and protect profitability while simultaneously streamlining, maybe even transforming client service in line with clients' um, evolving needs and expectations. And, and I'm pleased to say that our session um, today is in partnership with ClearPlan, um, as you can see. Uh, ClearPlan is the only dedicated partner of um, Workday Adaptive Planning in the UK. Uh, they implement analytics solutions for um, existing and new users of Adaptive. That's cloud-based planning, budgeting, and for uh, forecasting tools, enabling businesses to plan with greater agility for multiple different scenarios. Um, the team helps chief financial officers and other finance professionals to deliver reporting insights across the organization. Um, and in doing so can reduce budgeting time, um, make forecasting more accurate, and also um, increase profitability while managing workforce planning. Um, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the speakers who I'm going to be talking to um, in a little moment. Uh, just a reminder before I do so that the, um, the whole hour is being recorded and will be distributed to um, our briefing audience um, a little later. We, we also have plenty of time for you to ask questions based on what you hear or indeed to, um, to make your own comments, to provide your own perspectives. And you can do this as usual in the, um, in the chat at the bottom of the screen here in the Q&A. Um, I will um, be monitoring those questions and, um, and filtering them through to, to my guests. Um, and of course, if you want to um, ask a question live, you're more than welcome to, um, to come off mute and, and do that and, and speak to us today. Uh, just uh, make yourself known if, if that is something that you would like to do. Um, we like these to be as, um, as interactive and organic as possible, these conversations. So, so um, don't be shy, do, um, do speak up and uh, have your say. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to welcome my first guest and um, he is Andrew Brett. And uh, Andrew is the Group Reporting and Accounting Manager at the law firm Pinsent Masons. Hi. Hi. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Thanks, Richard, and uh, good morning to everybody. Hi. Thanks for thanks for joining us, Andrew. Um, so uh, we're we're talking about um, a a new uh, tool that you um, have implemented and the rationale for um, for doing that from a financial management perspective. So so first of all, what was the um, the trigger within Pinsent Masons for you and your your team, or the um, you know financial leadership at Pinsent Masons for realizing you needed a new approach to financial planning. That's right. So um, I'm probably going to describe a, a situation that's 
probably very familiar to a lot of people involved in the financial planning sort of uh, environment. So um, we were very heavily using Excel to do our planning. And um, whilst that was working for us to an extent, it was causing us a lot of issues when it came to bring the budget together um, and to, to close that out in a timely manner. So um, we, we were finding that version control was very much uh, an issue where, you know, you'd be working on a central link spreadsheet that was going off to various other models that were maybe modeling out the, the revenue and direct cost forecast for a practice group, then the, the overheads for a particular location and so on. And you can imagine that um, the uh, <laughs> when you went to uh, to a board meeting, and uh, somebody uh, then comes along and says, "Oh, what version did you use for my area of the model? Ah, mm. uh, you had version seventeen point one point four. Ah, no, no, there's a later version than that." So. We, we were finding there was a lot of challenges to bring together um, the, the, the budget in a, in a timely manner and an accurate sort of fashion as well. We were probably spending 70 to 80% of our time just trying to make sure that, you know, the data was, was there and was accurate um, right. and, and really not very much time actually understanding what that data and information was telling us. And you can imagine uh, when out of that board meeting, the uh, the FD, the CFO comes along and says, oh, that's great. Just a few little changes. We want to now change some of the uh, the team hierarchy structures. <laughs> you can imagine that was uh, leading to some to some screams. But the the real catalyst for sort of uh, us going and uh, adopting work to adaptive planning was uh, we merged with another law firm. And so overnight, we then were confronted with having two different practice management systems and two general ledgers to combine. Right. And um, that meant that in the initial days after the merger, we were taking say about 45 days to close out month end and produce management accounts. So we needed a solution that was able to give us a combined view of the firm's finances and the budgets and forecasts that went alongside that. Uh, one that could give us a view, not just for the firm as a whole, but by practice group, by a particular team within a practice group, regions, offices, being able to report in different currencies to give us that multi-dimensional view of the business. And of course, if we didn't have that, that meant that many benefits of the merger were going to be lost. So that led us to uh, using Adaptive um, for our budgeting and reporting. Right. So 45 days you needed to um you needed to significantly re reduce that did you that that's it yeah so you, you you can imagine you know people want to know well now that we've got this much bigger merge firm how are we doing um because you know there's we were told there would be all these benefits of the merger well where are they and you know we we simply couldn't tell them because we were trying to pull together all the, the bits of information or, yes, or rather yes, manually yeah, okay. Okay, well, um, then tell us um, a little bit about then what, um, what has changed then, therefore, in pra practical terms, um, since you, you've, you've been able to embed this new approach and maybe, maybe something of what that, what that process has involved. Yep. So now I'd say it's, it's very much we've, we've flipped that sort of 80-20 um, sort of uh, split that I, I talked about before. Mm -hmm. So now we're, we're able to spend at least 80% of the time interrogating the data, gleaning insights from it, being able to, um, you know, get get value and concentrate on sort of being business advisors uh, to the firm rather than worrying about trying to build the data. Um, it means that things that we weren't able to do before, such as what if scenario planning, um, where we might want to change some of the levers and dials. Um, you know, what, what if we recruit more lawyers in this area? What if we tweak charge out rates? Um, doing that before in Excel would have been very, very difficult to do. And we'd have been very limited. You might have managed to do maybe one scenario. Um, now okay. it's, it's possible to have multiple versions leading off the main model to just sort of test diff different areas. Um, it's, it's also meant as well that um, we're able to combine not just our PL model, but also the cash flow forecasting side of things as well. Um, you know, 
and that's that's previously in Excel proved to be very difficult because you're dealing with uh, you know different timings on payments and receipts where as a law firm you're obviously working for clients on a matter for maybe a quite a long period of time but the billing milestones and the cash inflows from that take a lot longer mm. um, so having a tool like adaptive means that we're able to take away a lot of manual effort with that and be able to forecast out our cash flows um, just makes it a lot smoother. So uh, sort of in, in the context of, um, you know, the last year and uh, sort of the, tur- the, you know, the turbulence that we've seen, presumably then that's um, maybe been um, a good example of where um, multiple scenario planning might might come in uh, might come in useful um, can, can you tell me a little bit about um, whether 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 that has, has been the case and, and maybe provide um, the uh, the listeners the um, the viewers a couple of um, couple of examples of things that you've you've been able to do to manage um, through I suppose challenging times more um, more flexibly more with, with greater agility that, that's it yeah so um, obviously when the the pandemic struck, it sort of took all of the sort of long held assumptions and the the planning horizon, which may have stretched sort of, you know, 12, 18, 24 months into the future. All of that went away and suddenly there was a a lot of uncertainty. People were only sort of, you know, thinking, what about next week, next month, next three months? Having a tool like Adaptive made it very easy to be able to um, take you know, here's, here's our actuals, here's a trend from those actuals. So if we just plot that forwards for the next quarter, six months, what's that looking like? Um, what's that telling us that the financial position of the firm is going to be like? You know, what's our cash position? How does that compare with maybe our banking facilities? You know, what's sort of the, the headroom that we've got? Mm. And then that sort of understanding our uh, give, giving the board, if you like, that confidence that we understood our current financial position, it then enabled us to be able to do a lot of scenario planning off that to say, well, what what if this, what what if that, um, and it it was probably one of the key drivers that we were able to navigate through that period of uncertainty, okay. because each each month we were able to update those forecasts, and you know gain that bit more confidence about where the business was heading through the pandemic. Um, it, it, it was a very useful tool for us. Okay, okay. And, is, and also within the, um, the current economic backdrop, is that, is that also something that, uh, that, that is helping you to, to navigate uh, differently to how you would have done in the past? That's it. Yeah. So um, it's a very scalable tool. So when, uh, you know, our business is expanding, particularly internationally. So whenever we go into a new region, looking at opening a new office, the tools very good at being able to scale to, you know, if we're bringing a new currency into the model, it's very easy to, to, to bring that in. If you're adding teams or new structures into the hierarchy, again, it's it's very scalable to be able to do that, and that's that's again that level of flexibility is is something that just just wasn't there in Excel. Right. Um, of course, the other thing as well is again in Excel, the you spend all your time trying to get an annual budget figure, but you were never really able to sort of look at the phasing and and how that actually flowed over the course of a year um whereas a tool like this the, the phasing is, is sort of integral to it so it's it's not like you spend ages doing the budget and then sort of think now what does that mean for the monthly management accounts how are we going to phase the budget it's it's already there for you so that that's you know a particularly useful thing that takes a lot of the the manual effort out of things I see. Thank you. Um, I suppose one of the other um, big themes that we've covered from all sorts of different perspectives in um, briefing recently is the volatile uh, talent market over, mm. over the last couple of years. Um, and see that, that's sort of been going pretty much in, in, in one direction, it seems. Um, are there any ways that um, this tool has helped you to um, think about that in that in a different way? I suppose most obviously in terms of you know the the cost of of bringing people on but also there's you know where they're working and the costs associated with that as well in a sort of hybrid hybrid working world 
Yeah. yeah. So um, sort of if, if you like, the engine room of our model is the, the personnel sheets and that, that effectively drives the revenue for the firm um, because, you know, we're bringing in all these fee earners and we can have assumptions about their chargeable hours, charge out rates, utilization. So it's a great way to, to have that, to drive the revenue, but then also it gives you great focus on your cost base as well because the biggest cost for a law firm is, of course, it's people. Mm. So all of that is effectively captured in, in one or two sheets where all that data is loaded in. So we're sort of starting the process, uh, kicking off with HR, we bring all that data in, that, that gives us the picture of where we are at the moment. And then we can start to say, you know, well, what if we're adding, you know, joiners, leavers, um, you know, speculative new teams, what, what does that sort of do to the shape of the business? Um, the model also allows for the fact that we're, we're a law firm and sometimes the revenue figures are a little bit of a negotiation because although the system might say a number, obviously, you know, sometimes that particular office team might be in a bit of a startup mode. So they, they might have slightly reduced revenue figures whilst they're growing their market or area. So the model allows for that ability to be able to say, well, this, this is maybe your capacity, what we think you could produce, but there's an opportunity to turn that up or down um, as, as you want to. Um, it's also um, been a great tool to leverage our sort of flexible legal resource business that, that we call Vario. Um, and the, this is where we're bringing in sort of self-employed legal professionals to work on particular projects or matters which you know could run for six months or maybe it's a shorter period of time so again the model allows us to have specific assumptions around those individuals and um, where the demand for their services is going to fall so is mm -hmm. that going to fall maybe in the uk maybe there's going to be a big increase in Germany because, you know, some of the, the matters that we're working on in Germany are going to benefit particularly from having that flexible resource to just get the work done in the time. So again, um, our, our model is a great way of being able to, to bring that in as well as the traditional sort of cost base of having, you know, bums on seats, if you were, that are permanent sort of mm. um, hires. Um with the um, with the tool in general, um, what, what's what's changed with how uh, sort of the, the data is um, is visualised for people to to consume, or or what can you potentially see in in the future there? If that's not something that um, you've been working on changing just yet, is it something that's on your on your mind? How how actionable, I suppose, data is um, for people to to make decisions based upon. That's that's it. Yeah. So so traditionally, finance data is all very sort of tabular columns and you know variances, and that that works great for sort of people like myself, qualified accountants, finance professionals. But if if you're dealing with sort of a wider audience, members of of the boards, group heads, people who are from a non-finance background, they probably don't want to process that data in in the same way. So. That's, that's where having the ability to have sort of a one-stop shop to show some of that trend um, and, and where things are heading visually is, is great. So again, um, the tool now has that ability to do that um, and it's becoming sort of the, the main landing page of the okay. budget model when, when you log in so that um, at a glance people can see this is where the, the current budget round is, is looking at the moment. This is sort of our progress in terms of trends against that with, with actuals. Um, and it's, it's a nice way for people to just be able to visually see um, how things are looking without having to run sort of, you know, detailed reports and try and interpret the data themselves. So that's, that's something that we're continuing to, to build on. Um, and it's, it's also sort of part of a, a wider project that I'm, I'm working on with our financial systems team that um, we're looking to sort of leverage a lot of the visualization capabilities to be able to explain our data more visually to, to people in the firm because, um, you know, it can, it, showing things as a trend over time can reveal things to you that's trying to show that in uh, 
you know, a sort of a tabular Excel Columns, spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, you know, it gets the message across a lot better. A picture says a thousand words and in sort of a, you know, as our business gains more complexity, more sort of offices and so on, being able to surface the trends and KPIs that really matter is, is you know, it's, it's a hot topic at the moment for us. And you're also looking at tailoring um, those, I think, in terms of um, you know what individuals need need to see, so they're not it's not sort of they're not sort of swamped in in data. It, it, uh, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. So again, um, you know, having the ability to um, ta tailor out and have access rights to it, so that people see the data that they need to see. They don't see things which um, you know they show them the staff entertaining budget visualized. They could get very uh, very obsessed <laughs> about that, but you don't necessarily want them to see that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so uh, you, you mentioned um, at the start, um, you know, that this uh, sort of switched the amount of time that, you know, you're spending doing, uh, uh, it reversed mm. the, the, um, the variable amount of time you were doing on sort of more value added work mm -hmm. and more manual, more manual work within the, within the finance team. Um, can you give us, tell, tell us a little more about what the, um, what that what that workload that role for um, for a finance professional now looks like and how that's different um, to what it would have been before um, how, how to what extent has it has it reshaped the work of finance in Pinsent Masons? Yep. So I think we've gone from being just if you like scorekeepers to now being sort of trusted business advisors and doing a much more business partnering role. So um, we've gone from just spending all the time. Um, trying to, to gather the data and making sure the data is accurate to now that side of things is done very quickly after each month end. Now it's all about, um, you know, gaining insight from that data. So, you know, all that extra time means that we can spend um, time analyzing and supporting teams who are working on projects, investments, um, you know, supporting say we've we've recently opened offices in the Netherlands and Luxembourg so again being able to have that time to support those local partners to help them understand um, you know the key drivers for the business um, and you know the areas that um, you know they can you know go away and try and grow their legal practice into all that is time that we simply didn't have before mm -hmm. so having a tool that enables us to just wrap up very quickly um the sort of data collection side of things just then means that we've got all this extra time to be able to be gaining insight and you know using that to the benefit of the business oh, i see okay and in summary can you tell us um you know how you um how you've measured the return on this this particular investment if indeed you've you've, you've, you've sort of done that officially formally yeah i mean we've um we've not sort of sat down and sort of you know worked out the exact numbers it's because we we felt that we, we haven't needed to because the return has been so apparent to us um you know it's, it's been repaid many times over the fact that um sort of the the, the headcount in the team um that have been producing the budgets and management accounts has been able to stay static over a long period of time it's because now we've got the tools that do all the heavy lifting for us. We don't need people to be, you know, trying to gather data or do lots of manual adjustments to Excel sheets and so on. All that's done for us. So the return has been, you know, it's very easy to see that, you know, we've been closing the month end probably within three days now, as opposed to yeah. taking the best part of 20 days. Budget process used to run for at least six months. So we'd be in the position where we were entering the new financial year, the budget wouldn't really be finished, we'd still be tinkering with it. Now the budget is closed off, you know, in less than half that time. Um, and not only that, but it enables us to do lots of, um, you know, different versions of the budget for people if they want to, you know, ex you know, what if the exchange rates move by a certain percentage and so on. Um, so yeah, the, the, the return has been, you know, has has been massive for us absolutely fantastic okay um and, and finally any um any future plans for for where this could go where this could go next um we've already already talked obviously about your your project to um to investigate um 
you know, data data visual, visualization. Mm. Um, anything else that um, that the tool has or or might have in future that um, you're particularly excited about? Yeah. So I think I think there's 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 two areas. It's continuing to leverage and grow the workforce planning side of the tool um, to to be able to take that to the next level and start mapping sort of our, our legal skills into it. So um, to, to highlight where, you know, not only the seniority of, of the lawyers in a particular location, but the actual skills that they have um, so that we can see, you know, maybe, you know, we've got a great sort of uh, strength in depth in a particular area, but we know that we might need to, to, to grow that in, in, in some other areas. Um, Secondly, as well, the tool has got these great machine learning capabilities. So it has the capability to be able to um, look at your predictions and forecasts and um, say whether or not it thinks that they're within tolerance. And that's an area that we want to sort of progress. So it's, it's a great way to be able to, to use it to sort of feedback into the model so it can sort of challenge areas where it says oh that looks like a bit of an outlier compared to historic trends and and so on so again using those tools will enable the model to get even better to be able to you know constantly refresh things okay thank you very much thank you andrew um yep. going to bring you back um a little a little later on because we do have some time for q a um at at the end and uh, i'm now joined by um, Greg Bowie, who is Head of Business Analysis at Brodies. Um, and we're going to be talking about um, one, of, one of his uh, projects, or actually a couple of, couple of different projects, but they're, uh, they're connected. Um, Greg, so um, to, to start off with, um, let's sort of talk about the, the macro picture. Um, uh, law firms, um, I think overall, uh, UK law firms have, have um, have done quite well on the profitability front over over the last couple of years. I think I saw um, in PwC's latest report at least um, at least two thirds of firms have seen profitability profitability growth. They say, but it's always um, a, a, a priority, isn't it? Profitability improvement or protection always on the radar for firms. Uh, but in what ways um, have you found that's been becoming more more complex or pressured or was changed in in in, in recent years from your firm's perspective? Yeah, well, um, first of all, hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Richard. Yeah, I think that, uh, that the more granular side of the profitability, I mean, obviously, at the, the kind of group level, you know, the, um, you know, as you say, the PwC report, law firms do enjoy profitability, but getting into the detail of that in terms of, um, obviously, the, some of the cost pressures that we're seeing, you know, through recruitment and retention, and also cost pressures associated with, you know, pricing competition, I mean, these kind of things are meaning that we want to maintain and improve profitability and keep that um, in our focus going forward. Um, there was also a general drive within the, within the business to develop cost metrics so that we can analyze profitability in more detail and get that information out to the partners so that they can make um, use that information to make um, profitability-based decisions. I mean, the kind of granular detail that, we're, that, that we are looking at is, you know, the specific parts of the business, you know, are they returning acceptable profit margin? Because obviously your profit margin will be made up of various different parts. Um, and then even more granular, you know, the profitability of clients and matters and which of those are returning um, acceptable profit margins to the business. We also wanted to understand the why so when we're looking at these teams, clients, or matters, what is it that we're doing that's making you know some clients or matters more profitable than others? You know, is it accuracy of budgeting or estimating of price? Is there something about the client or sector specific? Is it the work allocation resourcing model in terms of the, the seniority of the lawyers that are working on the client or matter? These are all important levers that, that, that are getting a lot of focus at the moment. Right, yeah. Thanks, Greg. Um, and um, you, you've uh, your firm has invested in or is looking at um, investing in building out a new um, profitability module. I, I think is that, if that's the right right word to use um, for your your practice management system. Um, what was that with, uh, for, from those drivers that you've mentioned? There was there a, was there a specific one um, that that led to that led to this particular project? 
Well, it was really a, I mean, a combination of all, all three, really. You know, of, of the, the the levers. Mm. I mean, the, you, you know, we 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 have a, a three year strategic cycle, and as part of the last strategic cycle, there was quite a big drive to you know increase insights and analysis into the the profitability of clients and matters, so that we could understand how they were contributing to the the overall profitability of a team or a practice area, and ultimately the wider business. I mean, up until now, really, and, and still, it's still ongoing this way. It's been done, you know, the profitability analysis has been carried out via an array of databases and spreadsheets, um, and they're used to interrogate the data, you know, and, and calculate, you know, cost per partner, cost per lawyer, and then present this information in the form of reports to partners. Mm. Um, I mean, this, this, still, this process provides and continues to provide key insights into the financial performance of um, teams, clients, and matters, but as part of this profitability uh, project, we wanted to make this information more accessible to the key decision makers and make it a more efficient process. I mean, from a finance per perspective, strategically, we wanted to spend more time analysing, presenting, and discussing the findings rather than spending a lot of time putting it all together um, and adding value by having those discussions and being able to get information, key information and profitability out quickly to, to the partners. So the profitability module is a way of automating that manual process. Okay, I see. So there's, there's a bit of a parallel there with what um, Andrew was talking about um, before, in terms of spending more time on more time on the analysis, less time having to having to find the data and manage things like spreadsheets. Interesting. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit, a bit about what that's involved then as a as a business change and a business change project, um, and your your role or your your team's role in. Um, in sort of leading it and getting it to happen, how how have um, different people in the firm needed to change in order to in order to use it in order to further your you know further your goals? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you have to get buy-in from you know the managing partner on the boards, and you have to get uh, you have to work closely with uh, colleagues in the financial reporting, you know, the finance systems, and the people engagement, the HR team. You know, to allocate some resource to the project, um, a, a lot of the information that we, we need to have to make the profitability project work, you know, didn't exist in in one place, so it had to be all pulled together. So getting that buy-in, you know, was was quite important. But I think it's important to point out as well in getting the buy-in. I mean, the manual process, although manual and time-consuming, that that provided a bit of a catalyst. Because then it was, you know, the, the the key decision makers, the partners were able to see the value in, you know, having that kind of information available to them. Okay. Um, and it, I suppose profitability, there's a lot of, you know, I suppose in finance, you know, sometimes it can be that, the, the, you know, you have to deliver bad news, but in getting buy-in, it was important to have some good news stories, to have, uh, <laughs> you know, clients matters, teams that are doing well and demonstrate how, why they're doing well, what it is what it is that they're doing that's making their profitability, um, uh, you know, up, up, up to the expectations. Yes. Um, so that, that was a key part of the, the buy-in, you know, getting those good news stories out and, and getting the, you know, the process and the methodology for, for you know, calculating profit margins at client, and, at client and matter level out to the partners. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and can you give me some examples of um, sort of management process Changes that um, that you think the firm will be able to introduce, or has al already been in, been able to introduce as as a result, um, you know, is, are people's performance is people's performance managed differently as a result, or how teams are are pulled together? You've, you've, you've referenced sort of resourcing already. Yeah, well, I, 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 something I wanted to point out as well is that um, I mean, when you're analysing profitability, it, it was it was important that we had a consistent output, um, and that when, when you're reporting, you know client and matter profitability, it might spread across different practice areas. So having that consistency and how you calculate the methodologies was, was, was important. So you need to have, you know, the consistent processes for or calculations for allocating, allocating direct and indirect overhead costs across all partners and lawyers working a client and matter. You know, and some of the challenges about, you know, the management process around that, formulating cost met metrics for partner compensation you know, and calculating costs per hour for lawyers. So these are things that um, when, with this new module, they will be done in a more automated basis rather than manual. Right. Um, 
confidentiality is key around all of that in terms of who gets to see what. You know, there's quite a lot of confidential information there. Um, and there's still challenges and, and decisions to be made about how that gets communicated out to the to the, the various teams and partners. Um, but the, the project's still ongoing, but the plan is obviously to make this more information more accessible to partners in real time sense, so that the profitability becomes one of the key metrics that sits alongside the more traditional metrics, such as capacity, realization, you know, work in progress, AR, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, there's more integration of the financial data at an individual lawyer level, which means we're moving towards analysis of profitability during the budgeting and estimating stage. You know, such as when the a partner's financially planning a client or matter, you know, the, the, the thinking going forward is that they'll have uh, a level of insight into the, the expected profitability or the forecasted profitability of that, that, that matter. Um, and this will enable more granular decision making around work allocation, so resourcing. So thinking about, you know, which lawyers, um, the seniority of lawyers to allocate to a, a, a matter, you know, based on capacity, profitability, you know, obviously have to, having having consideration for any client specifics and resource planning generally, you know, for example, recruitment, you know, do we need um, a different mix in that team? Um, yep. And obviously looking at the capacity of the, the existing lawyers and thinking about how that could be improved or changed in a way to to improve profitability. Oh, really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, we've got a bit the same same question to you as, uh, as I did to Andrew. Um, does the way that um, that your team or um, other people in the finance team work um, is that now is that now different day to day as a result of this? Can you give me a sense of how that's changed the workload, or indeed, I suppose even the structure of the um, of the finance team and how it works with with other groups around the firm, or if that's on the agenda? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, oh, I mean, as I said earlier, there, there was quite a lot of work in the manual side of calculating this uh, the profitability. Yeah. So, um, I mean, now that that will be automated. And that, that's obviously going to um, make quite a big difference to, to your day-to-day -day job. You know, you will be spending more time with um, the, the, the discussion, the analysis side of it, rather than calculating the data. Um, but it's also providing opportunities to um, look at the automation of certain tasks. You know, so in our volume business work streams, there's, there's quite a lot of work at the moment ongoing in terms of, uh, sorry, the legal the, and the, the legal process, you know, ongoing in terms of how can we automate that. So when we run these profitability analysis, um, we can identify, you know, areas that might be um, suitable for automation in order to improve that profitability margin. Yeah. Uh, I think also the the resource modelling, um, you know, actually sh being able to present that to um, the key decision makers is 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 focus of it will put, put, put a focus on how that model works and what can be done to um you know affect change there yeah. uh, in terms of the profitability module itself i mean there's there's there, as i said there was quite a lot of work in pulling the database together of um financial information you know the cost data but now we've got a monthly process for this, so obviously that will be um, a bit more automated, it's a bit more streamlined, and it's working across different areas. So the, the you know the people engagement team know exactly what they've got to provide, and it's automated in terms of how that gets um, uploaded into the the module. And then you know obviously we've got the most up to date information. Uh, then perhaps previously there was quite a lot of manual manual work around that. And we've also got the finance manager sitting in practice areas. So in time, the the thinking is that this will enable them to support the partners um, in understanding and forecasting profit margins by you know using evidence based pricing support. Okay. For the setting of client rates. That that would be something new, would it? That would be something that you you'd introduce new, or they, or they would just have more time to do that, or they would do it slightly differently. But, well, we, we do we do it at a moment, but it's, at the moment, but it's obviously because it's a lot of a manual manual task. It's it's small scale. This would be you know across a practice practice area or team where you'd yeah. have the the finance manager sitting in the the team, and they would be um, you know almost day to day operational support. Whereas at the moment, it's slightly more um, uh, strategic and ad hoc. I would say. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, is there any different about um, the? Ex is there anything different about the experience for clients in in this area? Um, you know, to what extent is it, is this is this um, difference seen by seen by your clients or in in client conversations, or is it is it pretty much an internal thing? Well, well, I suppose a profitable business that's in control of their resources will naturally be able to provide that enhanced level of service to their clients. But I mean, much of the profitability project is for internal consumption. Um, however, in saying that, I mean, I think Andrew touched on that sometimes pricing can be a bit of a negotiation. Mm. So the thinking will be that, you know, uh, we will have other partners will have, you know, the, the, a, an understanding of the profitability at a given point in time. And when they're having that discussion, they may be able to use that to um, help them to negotiate. Um, there's also other parts uh, that will be relevant to clients. So there's, there's another project ongoing, which is connected to this um, in terms of understanding the accuracy of cost estimates for litigation matters and okay. the profitability of those matters. So over time, this is this will enable additional insights into the cost of a particular type of litigation, which will be of benefit to the clients when advising on the, the progress and prospects of that litigation. Um, there's also the, the granular decision making around resource allocation, and that will help to, to keep to budget estimates and manage profitability, which ultimately will be uh, something that um, will be helpful to clients if we're able to um, resource accordingly to keep to a, a budget estimate. I see. Thank you. And um, finally, before I bring the others back, um, are there any other um, factors, pressures that we haven't touched on as yet that are sort of particularly high on your own your own radar as opportunities or risks? Yeah, well, uh, forecasting is, is getting quite a bit of focus at the moment. So this is, you know, taking the analysis of the profitability the resource allocation model and forecasting revenue uh, and future profitability. So this would be a, a team or maybe a group of clients level where we're looking at a sector, you know, we're thinking about a sector of clients um, and building in those, those levers into that. So this was this involves working with the partners to design a financial model that can be monitored and reported on. Um, there's obviously a pressure on pricing and rates. Yeah. Um, so that, that, you know, we're working with the partners to highlight existing client profitability, and then designing the work allocation model uh, and modeling pricing and rates to achieve acceptable levels of profitability. And then I think, and, and, and similar to, to Andrew, you know, the, uh, increasing the, the reporting and the representation of the data in a more graphical format. So that rather than, you know, lines of, of um, financial information, the key data is pulled out uh, and presented in a graphical format that can be easily digested and understood. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, lots to lots to think about there. And um, and now we're going to um, have um, at some time for some some more conversation based on on what what I've heard. Um, so I'm going to um, welcome back um, Andrew, as uh, as well as Mohammed Jaffa, who um, is a director at um, at Clearplan who um, it, it is the business who was um, working with Andrew, of course, on, on getting his project um, off the ground and, um, and into the future. So we, we have had a couple of, a couple of questions already. Uh, a reminder, do, um, do put your questions in the, in the Q&A at, um, at the bottom of the screen, and I will, I will feed them through into, into the conversation that we're now going to have for the remaining, remainder of the time. And we have a couple already. Um, so uh, this one is uh, for you, Andrew, um, based on what you had to say. Um, does the tool um, include functional any functionalities that, for example, Minitab, and I have to say, I don't know what Minitab is, so I hope, I hope you might, um, that, that that has, e.g., for example, produce control charts or hyp hypothesis testing. Um, yeah, so I think I think Minitab is like a st statistical tool. Um, so, and Mohammed may sort of come, come in here. Yeah. So basically, Adaptive has the concept of versions so you can have a main version of um, your budget model and then you can create many different versions of that if you want to change any of the variables you know that might be exchange rates charge out rates anything you want to change and then yes you can visualize the differences in its dashboarding section between those two models to see the difference you can compare them on on reports and you can you know 
export that data to, to Excel if you wanted to do some sort of further manipulation or charting of that data as well. Um, I don't know if yeah. Ahmed, you've got, yeah. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Um, and yeah, great question. Thank you for that. So as Andrew just said, you can run different scenarios in adaptive planning, but one of the key advantages of adaptive is that when you've built your budget or your forecast, because the system is very open, it can connect to tools like Minitab, which is a specific um, application for statistical analysis. So what finance can do is, is, is model their budget or forecast. And then at any point in time, the data can then be drawn by Minitab or whatever your favorite stat tool is to run those hypotheses tests that you'd like to and then that could feed back into adaptive if you if the outcome of one of the hypotheses is something that you you're keen on you could then build that back into another version in adaptive in your in your financial forecast there's also capability within the tool to build your own formulae but i i think a tool like minitab is probably better placed to do that real detailed statistical analysis Thank you very much, Mohammed, um, and welcome. Um, we we have a quite, uh, potentially potentially sensitive question, so I appreciate um, appreciate that. Um, do you um, to what extent do you have to uh, consider work around this person said um, the um, the partnership remuneration uh, model to uh, to make um, better use um, or, or indeed I suppose more accurate profitability predictions? Um, how, to what extent is that? Um, being factored into into your thinking, whether it involves this um, this technology, these technology changes, or or I suppose more generally. Yep. Do, do, do you want me to, <laughs> Sorry, to answer? And, Andrew, if you yeah. again, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so our, our key metric is is point value. So our management accounts are all about calculating the point point value in in, in our firm. Or different different partnership models sort of focus on different things. Our model is all about our partners hold points so it's about calculating the value of of a point and that informs uh, you what the partner's remuneration for that period is going to be the great thing with uh, adaptive as well once you've you've calculated that and you can use that as a kpi so you can see sort of you know any changes what that does to, to point value um you've obviously then got the impact on on cash so Part partnerships are based on a distribution model where partners get drawings maybe every month, every quarter. And then on top of that, there'll be a distribution of prior year profits. Um, and that distribution might be linked to the achievement of certain targets in the current year around billings and uh, cash collection. So having a tool like Adaptive means that you can you can model your base case that, you know, everything gets paid out as it should be in line with your sort of uh, partnership distribution schedule and then you can see but but what if you know your uh, cash receipts get delayed so your payment profile shifts and everything sort of moves along and you can see what that does to it so yeah it, it absolutely works with a partnership model and it's been very flexible for that great thank you andrew uh, greg have you got um, something to add on that yeah i mean well we had to uh we have agreed uh, numbers that, that are used for the the you know the, the partners if you like um, and that, that obviously had to be agreed at the the, the board level um, and in order to and the, the other the other key point was in order to maintain that consistency um, you have to have a consistent number um, so that it, it, you know you're able to look at the clients and matters across different practice areas and different teams um, so that 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 was a challenge but it was something that we had to agree a way forward for so that we could then look at uh, you know calculating a profit margin and all of this was taken against the um, management account as well so that there was alignment with the, the management accounts and um, so that if, if in effect if you pieced all the, the clients and all the clients back together again they should get to the management account aligned with the management account yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, we have another one. Um, are the process improvements um, that you've undertaken to improve some aspects of profitability carried out in conjunction with any a particular um, CI, a continuous improvement, I think that uh, that would stand for methodologies at all? Um, for example, Lean, Lean Six Sigma. Um, do, do either of your firms have um, a continuous improvement sort of project or initiative? I know several firms sort of launch things like this probably a decade or so ago, or 
possibly more recently. Uh, Greg? Yeah, I mean, not not specifically, you know, those those models. I wouldn't say. I mean, there's obviously the continuous improvement of. Uh, I mean, obviously the profitability is about profit margin, so mm. it's about maintaining that and improving it wherever possible. Um, I mean, there'll be, as I say, there's some, you know, some areas of the business um, perform better than others, and the, the continuous improvement is getting those that are perhaps not. Um, performing as well up to a required standard, but there's no formal kind of um, methodology applied to it in that sense. Or a particular function. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, have you got a have you got a sort of continuous improvement function or, or leader or, uh, or indeed we, methodology? We 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 do, yes. Yep. So that's that's something that's been introduced a couple of couple of years ago at our firm. And um it's it's something that they're particularly focused on um in terms of our client facing work where you know we, we really want to sort of drive drive value and improve our processes delivering services to clients. But of course, in something like a budget. Uh, sort of cycle ab absolutely every time you go through that you want to be feeding back your sort of learning um, outcomes into back into the model so that it gives you more accurate information next time so absolutely yeah Got it. okay thank you I'm very interested in this um the, the what if modeling that um that we talked about particularly particularly Andrew um you know the the, the um for example modeling how best to to expand uh, you know open offices overseas you talked about um the uh the, the ways in which you, you maybe tried to anticipate um what you might need to do during the pandemic which of course everyone has said you know there was, there was no playbook for um so, so, so I'm, I'm first come to, to Mohammed maybe um as 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 somebody who who has sort of seen how how other other businesses use um your your own tool of course um can, can you give me sort of an example of um or any other examples of the sorts of of sort of what if multiple scenarios that um either law firms or or other businesses i suppose um might be be factoring into their to their decision making and and, and the sort of impact that that being able to do that more than as andrew said you know j j just once perhaps um can ultimately have yes of course uh, i mean uh, talking to the guys at Workday Adaptive Planning, so of course everybody you know hunkered down during the pandemic, and as Andrew's already said, Adaptive Planning helped them massively to model and plan their way forward, doing lots of scenarios that were sort of three, six, nine months long to see what different outcomes would bring. When we when we spoke to the folks at Workday Adaptive Planning, because they obviously Adaptive is cloud based, so they can monitor the uh, the usage of the tool across their entire client base so they've got around seven thousand six or seven thousand corporate clients using workday adaptive planning and what they noticed was that at the onset of the pandemic the number of versions so in adaptive planning you have the concept of a, of a budget or a forecast and as andrew's already said you can create different versions so you might have forecast one forecast two what if model one what if model two they saw an increase of 15 to 20 fold of companies that were using adaptive planning spinning up new versions so you know the the, the rate increased by 15 times to what it would normally be they could monitor that because they can see the disk usage and uh, the, the the number of times people were logging into their models so it's clear that through the pandemic the adaptive planning user base was using the tool to say hey you know what this has never happened before what are we going to do what are the different outcomes what's the impact of furlough what's the impact of laying off people and then having to hire people again knowing what the hiring profile is going to look like if we lay people off when we come out the other side of the pandemic what is how long is it going to take us before but we're back up to full capacity we're back up to full profitability maybe it's better to take the hit and not lay people off right so there were some mm. big decisions that firms needed to make and we mm. and there's rather than just state one instance or one customer the whole user community as a whole it increased by 15 to 20 fold interesting okay thank you um uh, Greg, I um, appreciate we didn't we didn't talk about this particularly in our in our sec in our segment. But um, is that something that um, you can see that applies to to the sorts of decisions that that Brody's had to make, or or is increasingly having to make in a sort of you know in a, in a more uncertain or increased or um, continually continually uncertain sort of backdrop? 
Yeah, in, in, in terms of what if scenarios, yeah, I mean that I, I suppose it's it's um that would be something that might be done at a you know a kind of more overall, you know, firm wide, you know, looking at um maybe like a three year plan, a five year plan mm. of where we think um things might go and what we might need to to get is there. Um and the kind of pressures that might come in from yeah the the, the uncertainty in, in the economy um and the world generally and obviously increasing increasing pressures around cost. Um so yeah it's 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 something that is being looked at from from through that lens really um and it's something that we will be doing more of going forward. And and um Andrew do you do you see um any other other instances of of how you might um, make use of that sort of coming down, coming down the track, or are there any examples that, that we didn't touch on before um, that uh, w- where the firm has been able to, um, you know, respond respond differently to to changing circumstances? Yeah, I think um, you know, there's, uh, if if you take uh, the sort of economic backdrop at the moment with with inflation as it is, uh, the, the cost pressures. It enables us to to be able to do again just a base case, but then test that against changing the levers and dials as as you see fit. So, um, you know, and and you're able to see is is there real growth in the business, or is it coming from maybe just inflationary increases, um, or are people actually are we are we getting more utilization from our fee earners? So is it a real increase in profits or you know, not not just inflation, but exchange rate movements as well. Our yeah. firm's grown internationally, so we're more at the whim of, you know, the the pound to euro or currencies linked to the US dollar, mm-hmm. and you know, is actually some of the growth coming from that. So the ability to strip out that and report things at a constant currency sort of level year on year means means that you can identify, you know, where's the growth in the business coming from. Thank you. Um, um, and, and thank you, um, thank you all three of you, and also to um, everybody who um, who came along to um, to watch and ask questions um, today. Uh, that's all we've got time for. I, I hope um, I hope you'll join us again for for another briefing webcast in future. But I just would like to thank um, Greg uh, Greg Berry at uh, at Brodie's, um, Andrew Brett at um, at Pints and Masons, and also uh, Mohammed Jaffa uh, at our partner uh, Clearplan. Um, for all of your perspectives this morning. That was a really interesting um, couple of case studies and discussion. Thank you very much.